While conspiracy theorists are notorious examples of bad logic and poor reasoning, there are others who are worse and actively poisoning discussion of- Yeah, SpaceX fanboys. We get it. I need an intro. No, you need time management skills. Get on with it. Fine. The SLS versus Starship discussion is kind of one-sided. You get heaps and heaps of praise towards Starship, with no one see seemingly no one criticizing the design or any aspect of it. And then on the other hand, with SLS, you get just heaps and heaps of harsh, mostly unjustifiable criticism by people who dedicate every article they write to hating on it. So guess what? Let's criticize Starship. This will end well. Good morning everyone, I'm the pressure fed astronaut here to take on space hoaxers, moon landing deniers, and talk about aerospace engineering while doing so. Guess what, we're talking about aerospace engineering again, isn't that great? In the last video, we watched two SpaceX fanboys attempt to compare NASA's space launch system and SpaceX's proposed Starship. Their analysis was uncritical, condescending, and lacked a basic understanding of half the ideas of what they were talking about. You know, like what your average internet commenter does. I'm aware of the irony. And I promised that this video would be criticizing Starship. It's not. As it turns out, when I started writing the script for this, there were actually two videos in one. Criticizing Starship from a blank slate, me going, ha, you're wrong, doesn't make much sense. Because real criticism comes from understanding what Starship is trying to do. And that, of course, is lowering the cost of access to orbit. So, guess what we're going to talk about? Lowering the cost of access to orbit. And we're also going to talk about the realities of the launch market while doing so. Because, turns out, that's a real thing. Yeah, that's right, and the gosh darn evil business majors got in our cool rockets. But, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll butter you up with rocket talk first. So without further ado, let's take a look at the first way to make rockets cheaper. The simplest way to make rockets cheaper is to make them easier to build. Like I said in the last video, the reason SLS can only fly once, maybe twice a year, is because you can only build about one per year. Maybe two. Part of this is because, I mean it's complex, but the real, one of the big problems is the tools. SLS is designed for flight, not for production. Uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, if you want to build an SLS tank, you have to build the tools specifically to build the SLS tank. Another way of approaching the problem is to take existing tank building setups and use those, repurpose them for aerospace manufacturing. It's not exactly a one-to-one -one thing, but it's designed instead, instead of flight performance, it's for production. So in other words, the tools that are building SLS are tools specifically designed to build SLS. And, you know, vehicles like it. If instead we designed SLS to be made out of tools that already exist, which means sort of how it's working, but instead more commercially available tooling, we could theoretically lower costs. Because now your rocket is designed not for flight performance, but for production. It's hard to explain. The other two are much easier. It's, what you're looking at here is, instead of building aerospace grade, specialized, you know, nuts and bolts, you're gonna go find a commercially available one at Home Depot. Uh, a great book on the subject, uh, The Rocket Company, this one, uh, calls this the refrigerator theory. Do you know the difference between this and a regeneratively cooled rocket engine is? A refrigerator, much like a regeneratively cooled rocket engine, has an interior that's warm that you don't want to be. 
In the case of the refrigerator, it's you know, my, my frozen pizza and my poor diet. Through a rocket engine, it's the fact that you don't want the inside to be so hot it melts the inside of the engine. This is achieved by running pipes around the vessel where a fluid is pumped through to take the heat away. For a refrigerator, it's, it's water. For a rocket engine, it's the fuel, most likely. And of course, once you start getting to the nitty gritty, of course, it's this is a lot easier to make than a rocket engine. The tolerances are different, but conceptually speaking, these are the same. Essentially, you design your booster for mass production. A single cell phone is really expensive. A hundred cell phones is cheaper, and a thousand is even cheaper than that. The same could be said about launch systems. In fact, if it weren't for you know, trade restrictions, China would be dominating the launch market through this alone. They designed their boosters for mass production, to an extent. Uh, the Soviets did a similar thing, too. Chinese are just copying them. Others in the industry are tackling this problem through part commonalities, stage geometry, sizing, and other weird complex methods. But the thing is here, this is kind of the starter pack for a cheaper launch vehicle. How do you go cheaper? You're asking, I think. Well, the one, this one's obvious. Reuse the vehicle. Surprised? Reusability has been the goal since the 60s. You see, you can pr mass produce a rocket, you can make it cheaper that way, but it's still going to have a lot of high performance equipment on board. Yeah, rocket regeneratively cooled rocket engines are a lot like refrigerators, but they're still expensive to make, produce, and operate. Now, if you look at the United Launch Alliance, uh, they're, according to them, engines are 60% of the cost of their first stage. Uh, the pie chart here, here. So that's a lot of money still going into the drink. So what's the best way to fix this? Bring them back. Use them again somehow. Uh, there's two ways we're seeing uh, kind of come into fruition right now. Uh, the first one is booster flyback, and the second we're under development is just engine recovery. What SpaceX is doing and Blue Origin plans on doing is booster recovery. The first stage will perform its normal burn, and once it stages, we'll either land on a barge or land back at the launch site to be brought back in, refurbished, and fly again. The goal here, of course, is to cut down first stage production so that only only reason you'd be building them is to replace old ones at the end of their operational lives and instead focus all of your manufacturing on second stages. While this seems simple, it actually isn't. Uh, to get your rocket to do this, you've got to do a lot of upfront engineering. A big one here, of course, is trajectory optimization. If you want to detach your booster and fly it back, you've got to optimize your trajectory so it can do that. Where are you going to stage? How fast will your rocket be going when it stages? What altitudes? What are the limitations to this? Not only that, you also have to re-engineer your engines to start up again so they can do landing burns. Then you have to rebuild the stage structure so it can accommodate landing legs and landing loads, as well as aerodynamic loading from stage separation and boost back. And only that, you have to design a guidance system that has to optimize for landing. Your rocket's coming down to a barge, you gotta teach it how to land on a barge or back at the launch site. You have to manage propellant, you gotta manage trajectory, you gotta take in atmospheric conditions. There's a lot that actually goes into this. In terms of an initial investment, a reasonable booster will always be more expensive than an an expendable one, be, you know, because of the reasons above. It's engineering. The United Launch Alliance is trying to skip some of this by just recovering the most expensive part of their first stage, the engines, with uh, smart reuse. You're still going to have to engineer your booster for reuse, and that's going to be an upfront cost. Theoretically, you'll lower launch costs because building first stages is expensive compared to just refurbishing them and flying them again, theoretically. And you're still going to be stuck with the costs of, well, you still got to build second stages, you still have to have propellant, you still got launch pads. There's still a lot of infrastructure already there. So theoretically, reuse is cheaper. And of course, the other problem here is obvious. A used Ferrari is still a Ferrari. I can buy a used, I can buy one off Magnum for, you know, a tenth the cost of an original Ferrari. But if it breaks, I still got to go to the Ferrari dealership to you know, get it fixed. I need Ferrari parts. So what if we made a minivan instead of a Ferrari? Let's 
Let's take a look at that chart again and take a look at a picture of an RL10 engine. Engines and structures are a massive cost on the first stage. And it's got to get where we're going here. Let's, let's take a step back for a second. Okay, now what? Making high performance expensive engines and using lightweight but strong alloys in your rocket is doing essentially one real thing. Reducing the amount of propellant you need, I guess. I mean, I thought it was to maximize payload capacity. Mostly it's for payload performance. But we're thinking outside the box here. Look at that chart again. The expensive, the two really expensive parts here are being used to reduce the amount of the least expensive component of a launch. So here's the, here's a secret. You don't need turbo pumps to make a good engine and you don't need these high strength lightweight alloys to make a good vehicle. The third way to theoretically lower launch costs is to build an ultra expendable launch system. Now these were studied back in the 60s by NASA and the Air Force for their potential future vehicles. Essentially what you're building is a low tech, dirt cheap rocket. Uh, take your engines for example. Current launch systems use turbo pumps and all a bunch of other things to squeeze every ounce of performance out of their engines. And as a result, they have incredibly tight tolerances for manufacturing and operations and handling, which makes them really expensive. You know what it isn't? A pressure-fed engine. It's got three moving parts. The pressure valve, the oxidizer valve, and the fuel valve. That's it. I mean, not really, of course, but that's effectively it. Sure, pressure-fed engines are the lowest performing out of all of them because of how simple they are, but who cares? Propellant is cheap. And because their engines are simpler, they'll be cheaper too. As for your vehicle structures, uh, well, those are gonna be heavier too. Pressure-fed engines need high pressure tanks. High pressure tank needs uh, thick tank walls, which means heavier tanks. And then of course, you're not gonna be building your tanks out of you know, aerospace grade aluminums, you're gonna be building out of steel. But hey, steel's cheap. Propellant is cheap. The name Big Dumb Booster comes most likely from its detractors. It being a lower tech and larger launch system, the name kind of fits. And it could have lowered launch costs, uh, theoretically, and you know, could have. I'm gonna emphasize that part, could have. Of course, the criticism here is that, sure, maybe the booster itself is cheaper, but the ground support infrastructure won't be because you have to build it to accommodate your big dumb booster. So, you know, pad interfaces, all that might not actually be cheaper, just the, the rocket part. Of course, we don't really know because the last real attempt at a big dumb booster was Beale Aerospace back in 2002. I should admit that I have some bias toward big dumb boosters. I personally believe that they are the most viable option. But we're not talking about that. We're gonna go from kind of the basics now to something much more complicated. Uh, these three aren't mutually exclusive. They can mix and match them. Uh, Otreg, for example, the first private rocket was a big dumb booster, but mass produced multiple big dumb boosters clustered together. Uh, Robert Truex's Sea Dragon, the, the OG big dumb booster, was designed for its first stage to be reused after landing in the ocean. There's other ways you could do this. There's Okay, not that many actually, because not many people have been, you know, mixing and matching. There's not really much you can do. Uh, there are other methods of theoretical low-cost space access, like space guns, but those have limited applicability or are dependent on a lot of research that's just not done yet. Um, I'm looking at you, space elevators. Now that we've, you know, taken a look at how you could lower the cost of rockets, we should take a look at the launch market, also known as what kind of payload is your rocket going to carry? Uh, there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all launch vehicle. If someone does come up to you saying, I have, I have one, they're either delusional, lying, or figure out how to make OTRAG work. Instead, if you're building a low-cost launch vehicle, you should try to optimize it for a certain market. You're thinking, what does that mean? It's like selling a car. Cadillacs are meant for your grandpa. Big trucks are meant for your redneck cousin Cletus. And then Teslas are bought by Silicon Valley nerds. Then you can go on from there. Satellites 
are kind of like that. They have different markets and different purposes. They go to different orbits. Take the European Ariana launcher, for example. It's a three-stage booster meant specifically for the geostationary satellite market. The first two stages were propelled by then cheaper, this is the 80s we're talking about, uh, storable propellants, while the upper stage, the third stage, was liquid hydrogen, which would do the kind of the, the big push towards geostationary transfer orbit. It's optimized for that. Another great design of the Ariana was its ability to dual manifest payloads. It could carry two satellites at once, which means you could buddy up, lower launch costs. And what helped it was the failure of the space shuttle to, to live up to expectations, which really opened up the market for Ariana. Uh, the space launch system is designed to be a government launch system. It's meant for NASA payloads, flagship missions to you know Jupiter and wherever, uh, and crewed Artemis flights or Orion or whatever succeeds it. Yes, the user's guide talks about low Earth orbit capacity, but in reality, SLS doesn't go into LEO. You'd actually have to modify the, the trajectory for that to work. It's an interplanetary launcher. Uh, the moon counts as interplanetary, by the way. And to emphasize this point, it's not a commercial launch vehicle. It's not meant to compete against anything. Uh, another cool example is the Aquarius system, which is what I'd call a big, dumb SSTO. It was an interesting single stage to orbit design meant specifically to carry logistics to low Earth orbit. So it's not launching satellites, it's launching satellite fuel or food or water or other raw materials. It would achieve low cost because it's got a big pressure fed LOX LH2 engine and it would have a reliability of about two thirds, which means one out of every three flight would most likely fail by design. It was an interesting and unique system catering to a specific market. The point is, if you want to enter the commercial launch business, your rocket's got to meet a certain demand. For example, there are about 83 small sat launchers being developed right now. Uh, in that list includes like national launchers being built, it's like Indonesia's building one, Pakistan, Iran. But we're not gonna talk about those. Instead, we're talking about the private launch companies which they're all kind of aiming for the under 500 kilograms to LEO market, and most of them are gonna fail. Why? Well, the market doesn't need 73 individual small sat launchers. Why? Yeah, uh, cars again. There's only so many predators out there to buy windowless white vans. Or, well, think about those weird as seen on TV products you see on TV. A lot of those are marketed towards handicapped people, but since there aren't that many handicapped people around, these companies will advertise them on TV in the desperate hopes that you, a non-handicapped person, are in desperate need of a Snuggie. For some reason, there's different markets. Uh, Direct TV goes to the geostationary market because that's the great place to broadcast TV down, right? Because the satellite is hovering over a certain spot so you can always broadcast over there. Uh, resource satellites, weather satellites, generally end up in polar orbits that I haven't drawn here because they will fly over the poles and the Earth will rotate under them so you can get you know, a full view of the Earth every day. What I'm getting at here is that your launcher should either do its niche better than existing launchers or do it cheaper to a reasonable extent. And of course your vehicle should be within reasonable payload capacities. Uh, bigger rockets are generally cheaper than smaller rockets in terms of dollars per kilogram to LEO. However, that does not mean I'm going to be using a Saturn V to launch a CubeSat. So when you're designing your low-cost launch vehicle, because I know you all are, you should really aim its payload capacity to fit within the existing market or a potential extrapolation of said market. Uh, as an example, uh, geostationary satellites are at most 8 metric tons. Now, a launch vehicle like New Glenn which is becoming online next year, it has 45 tons uh, payload capacity to LEO, 13 to geostationary transfer orbit, which means since most geostationary satellites are lighter than eight tons, it could carry maybe two or three. It's optimized perfectly for that market. What about Falcon Heavy? Yes, it can theoretically carry 63.8 metric tons to low Earth orbit in its fully expendable mode but it actually can't. If you read its user's guide, the payload attached fitting limits how much it can carry to about 
12 to 15 metric tons in, of payload. If you want to carry anything heavier, you'd have to build your own payload attach fitting, and you'd have to probably rebuild the second stage to accommodate the heavier mass. Plus, the Falcon's payload fairing is just too small for any massive payloads anyway, so it's not exactly catering to any real market. The three cheapening methods I've described here aren't as simple as, do this. In reality, there are a lot of other considerations to take into account. Uh, pad costs, launch market demand, bunch of other weird nerd things. But the one here we should emphasize is flight rate. As kind of a rule of thumb, as, as with anything, the more you do it, the cheaper it becomes. The space shuttle was touted as flying once every two weeks. This was because an accountant did the math. So for the shuttle to break even in terms of costs for R&D, launch pad facilities, paying the astronauts, putting satellites on the rockets, uh, infrastructure, pad engineers, happy janitors, good food. The shuttle had to fly once every two weeks to be viable. Any less, it'd be a money sink. Any more, it'd make money. Which it didn't happen, of course, but we're not talking about that. So the point is, it's not that simple, and it's very, very, very circumstantial for these methods to actually work. SpaceX is generating profits already. Uh, that's unlikely. Now, of course, SpaceX is a private company, so we don't actually have access to their financials. But the kind of the current belief among most is that right now, reuse is either marginally profitable or not profitable at all. But simply, it's just they're not launching enough. Starlink. Ah, yes. Launching your own payloads. That's like writing a book and then buying all the copies of it you know, the weekend it comes out and calling it a bestseller. Sure, someone bought all the copies of the book, but it's you. You bought your own book, and you're not making money off the deal because you spent it all on the book. Any profits that go to you will be like you know, half or whatever you know, authors make off their books. You're actually losing money on the deal. You're not actually selling copies. You're just buying it for yourself. Oh, and also, if they are making a profit, and it is as profitable as folks like to say, why is SpaceX still trying to scrounge up money for half their projects? Mars? <sighs> Enough. We're getting into Starship territory now, so we're going to cut it off here. I'm the pressure-fed astronaut, big dumb booster advocate, and not a reusable rocket. In the next video, we will be looking at Starship in a way that isn't mindless gushing because I did real analysis of it. And the conclusions are, um, not a good design. Don't know what Elon's thinking. Now, of course, since this video is a precursor to that one, I do hope you took notes. I didn't. Um, it's all folks. Uh, see you next, the next month or five in the next video. So until then, uh, Bye.